I'm Neil Ewald, uh, Senior Vice President at Green Diamond. I am in forestry today because I was a good student in high school and not such a good student in college. So I got into Berkeley and uh, I was going to be a doctor. And uh, I realized that uh, girls and beer being a first two priorities would not conducive to medical school. So I wasn't a very good student. Uh, I think I in ended the, my career with a 3.1 or something, great point. Average. Not very, not good enough to get into graduate school for sure. So um, I went to forestry school and uh, there I found that I was able to do the things that I really liked to do, which was almost everything. Forestry is a very diverse uh, uh, field and so I was, I was exposed to engineering and economics and biology and uh, human resources and all those things that uh, allow me to have a very wonderful job. And I like to claim that I'm the luckiest person anyone's ever met because I've had this wonderful career and I got to manage a forest, uh, well, for almost the last 30 years. So it's been remarkable for me. I grew up in uh, Santa Cruz, California, and I was uh, living on the beach as a, a student. Uh, I went to SoCal High School, and uh, as I said, I was a, a good student. I was the president of the California uh, uh, Scholarship Federation, CSF. Oh, wow, that was my claim to fame. But uh, I love the woods, and uh, I'd go hiking and fishing and and uh, spending most of my days outside. In fact, uh, in Santa Cruz in the 60s and 70s is a lot like Humboldt County today. So you could park at the beach, you could hike in the woods, uh, you could go deer hunting and fishing almost anywhere. So uh, I really enjoyed that. And uh, when it became clear I wasn't gonna get into medical school, I thought, well, what else can I do? Uh, I have a passion for the ocean and I, just, I became a marine biology major for a while. And then uh, I looked into forestry school and uh, that's where I knew that I was gonna find a, a lot of uh, satisfaction in a career, so. And besides, my dad was a fire lookout uh, somewhere. Uh, yeah, he died when I was 16, so I never really, uh, he never really got to see what I did in my career, but uh, so there was some connection to forestry in my family, but not like many others in this profession who have giants in their, in their uh, family history. But a little bit for me, so. I was admitted to uh, UC Berkeley as a freshman because I was a good student, and I didn't quite have the money to go, even though it was pretty uh, reasonable. So um, I, st I stood one semester out, or no, one year out, um, uh, actually with the, uh, a community college. And, uh, and so I went, uh, I was admitted as a sophomore, which is really rare. And I think one of the reasons I was admitted is my guidance counselor had also gone to Berkeley, so he was able to pull some strings to get me back in. And so uh, uh, I essentially went to Berkeley for four years, plus a year in a junior college at uh, Cabrillo in, uh, in Santa Cruz County. And uh, so uh, Berkeley was a great place to leave. Uh, when I was a student, I, uh, I didn't like the city at all. I didn't like the urban environment. And uh, so I was, I was really happy to leave, and I left uh, I graduated in March, uh, a quarter ahead of all my, all my friends, and so I went to work in the woods. Um, in fact, uh, my first job in the woods was a job for Arcata Redwood Company. Um, I was swinging an axe on a uh, timber uh, stand improvement crew, and uh, as it so happens, uh, that piece of real estate that I worked on back in the summer of 1977, I still manage it. And uh, it's, in fact, uh, next, uh, week I'm headed up there to look at one of the stands that uh, I did PCT work in, pre-commercial thinning work, and the trees were maybe three or four inches in diameter. You bend them over with your left hand and hit them with an axe on your right. And, um, and the last time I went up there was about five years ago, and the, the timber's about 28 or 30 inches in diameter. So it makes you feel old in one sense, but uh, gratified in another that the you know, forestry really works, you know. So. I'll go back and see it now just before it's, uh, it's second thinning and uh, we'll see how long we can keep the, the stand alive. I, I think if anything, um, I, I study with a, uh, a bunch of giants. Uh, the people, the professors at Berkeley at that time, I think in 1976 it was rated the best forestry school in the nation. So we had uh, Zibnuska and Helms and Zinke and you know, all these people uh, uh, who were, uh, preeminent in their field, you know, and uh, and I, uh, I would say, I, I think someone said it best. And I think it was John Helms uh, who said uh, I was a sleeper, 
Um, in, in other words, I was not remarkable in any way <laughs> when I was in school. Uh, and I was at some event with John Helms, uh, I think, um, some years after I graduated. And he mentioned that, uh, you know, he, I think it was his way of saying he didn't remember who the heck I was. And uh, um, But I certainly didn't stand out in any way. Uh, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, top students who went on to grad school and so on in my class. And uh, when I was in Berkeley, there were 96 people, I think, in the forestry school. And so uh, I was just uh, uh, in the middle of the pack and getting by. And uh, um, when the summer jobs were let out, there were jobs at uh, Weyerhaeuser and Collins Pine, and internships in Georgia, Pacific, all these great jobs. And they were um, jobs where you would learn the craft in the summer. And instead, I learned how to run an axe in the summer. So I actually did physical work, and it wasn't, I didn't learn much at all. Um, but the company I worked for um, made a request to all of us on this crew, if anyone wants to do a science project to do some kind of study, let us know. And so uh, I was among two people who said, I'll, I'll do it. And uh, um, I did a, an establishment study. You'll find this funny now, at the advent of modern forestry. But I was trying to determine whether or not there was um, any bias by sight from regeneration uh, after aerial seeding from helicopters. So if you can imagine, we used to dump seed from helicopters out on the, uh, as a regeneration technique. My job was, or my study was to see if we could uh, determine if there was a differential regeneration rate on different sites, which of course came to nothing because the year or two later we started planting by hand. But, but I think uh, that may have been one of the reasons that uh, I went back to school and graduated. And uh, on the day after my last final on um, St. Patrick's Day, I got a call at six in the morning asking me to come back to work if I want a job. So, so I, I've had uh, two, since the end of my college career, I've had two days off before coming to work up here, and, uh, except for vacations and so on, but I've been employed up here uh, since uh, March 20th of 1977. So I was uh, asked to come back as uh, what they call the civiculturist, someone who would uh -huh. do the tree planting and the, and the burning of the sites after the harvesting and so on. And then uh, three days after I showed up, uh, I was told, no, that's not the job we want for you. We want you to be an engineer. Um, and so my job was to lay out stream zones and uh, uh, property boundaries and harvesting unit boundaries. So it was essentially working uh, north of the Klamath River in very steep topography. Uh, laying out clear cuts in old growth redwood trees. And so that was uh, how I started my career. And uh, when you think about that, um, uh, old growth redwood harvesting um, has a shelf life or a term. And, uh, and so I got a job there uh, knowing that I needed to find something else because uh, uh, I think we had a, a date on a map, I think it was 1987, when we couldn't do this anymore because there would be no trees left of that size. And so uh, um, I also went to work during a time when uh, there was a bit of a boom in the late 70s and the uh, log prices were skyrocketing and we bought, uh, Arcata Redwood bought uh, 30,000 acres of uh, a property in uh, Smith River, the Simonson Lumber Company. So I got to cruise and, you know, got to be a real forester for a while. And, uh, and then not long after that was uh, this hyperinflation of the mid 80s with uh, double digit interest rates and the, the economy flagged. And so uh, I went to uh, one job after another in the woods. And uh, uh, my uh, claim to fame was that I was the cheapest guy on the payroll. And so uh, my, I go to a meeting with uh, 15 guys and 12 guys would survive or 10. And then we'd divvy up the work and go back to work the next day. So um, I got to do a lot of things. And I did almost every job in the woods except fall timber and run a yarder. So I did logging and uh, I ran a dump truck on the road crew. Uh, I planted trees. I ran uh, tree planting crews. Uh, you know, I was a chaser under a yarder. And uh, the most fun thing I ever did was uh, I was a powder monkey for a summer. And uh, powder monkey's job is to blow up stumps. And uh, so I got to use uh, dynamite 
and uh, oh, uh, ammonium nitrate, I think it is. The same stuff that was in Oklahoma City, unfortunately. But uh, So I became expert at uh, blowing things up. And when you think about it, if you're 26 years old and your job is to blow things up, the world is, <laughs> doesn't get much better than that. And uh, so I had this wonderful time uh, working. My wife was not too happy about the dynamite part of my job, but uh, it was about that time that I decided to go back to business school. That I thought uh, forestry was an interesting idea, but uh, sooner or later I was going to get laid off. And so uh, big things happened in that year. That was 1983, and that was the year I got married and the year I went back to Humboldt States. Uh, I had a night program in uh, business, so ultimately I got an MBA. Um, it took me uh, seven years. So I started in 83 and I finished in May of 1990. Uh, I took five courses a year and working full time. So I get up at uh, five in the morning and uh, work until 4.30 and get home at five, uh, leave at 5.30, get to school at six, a class from six to eight and a class from eight to 10. And uh, two, uh, I did five courses a year. That's about all I could do. And uh, I couldn't work that hard in the spring. There's just too much going on. So ultimately after uh, seven years, 19 courses, I, I got an MBA. It was the getting it while I was working that was the most important part for me because I could understand much better uh, what a income statement looked like when I could see a logging job and understand all the elements of that in relation to what I was doing at work. So I think it was a great uh, opportunity to do it. Uh, my MBA cost me $6. Um, I uh, got tuition and books paid for through Arcata Redwood when I worked there. And then later on, I worked for Simpson. They paid for tuition, but not books. I bought a used book for six bucks. And so uh, f I have a, 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 a claim that my MBA was at least worth that much. Uh, but it, more than anything else, a lot of it is a lot of business is common sense. Um, and so once you understand a few fundamentals, it just really helps you understand why decisions are made uh, and to be able to bridge the the uh, force management with business management, uh, it, it's, it's quite gratifying, actually. I really, really enjoy that. And, uh, and it, 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 if you can make money and make a forest at the same time, um, uh, it's not an either or. Uh, I've been battling either or my life, most of my life with environmental matters. You know, you have to choose between evil and good. No, you can have, you can have profitability and you can have a, 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 a thriving forest and you can get both. And, uh, and so I was fortunate that I was able to be at a, a place in my career where I could actually take my MBA and put it back into the woods. And, uh, and I think I told you I was the luckiest person you ever met. If I haven't, let me tell you that now. Uh, I was able to, uh, upon the finishing of my MBA, um, the company I worked for was sold. Arcata Redwood was sold to Simpson Timber. And Simpson decided to run our business intact instead of blending it in. So Arcata Redwood was an entity within the Simpson Timber Company. And so my boss became the general manager who ran the sawmills in the woods, and I ran the woods for him. So in 1988, I was 33 years old, I was running the woods. Uh, and uh, it was still an old growth business that was, the old growth was relegated to Arcata Redwood. And uh, so I did that for a number of years. So when I look back at my career, um, um, in 1988, I was running the woods for Arcata Redwood Company. In 1991, the, the fellow that ran the woods at Simpson retired, and they were looking to replace him, and uh, I applied for the job. And because I was neck deep in all this legislative and regulatory battle, um, and that's the company was facing, you know, demise if we if it went the wrong way. So I got that job. I think mostly because of, of the work I was doing in Sacramento. But again, lucky me, right? And so uh, here I was, uh, let's see, I was 36 years old running the woods at Simpson. I was, uh, you know, it's just this wonderful job. Uh, so my job at Arcata Redwood was to, uh, was to harvest all the old growth, right? Uh, it's still the same job, but a bigger company that I had when I started in 88 or 78. But uh, now my job was to work in a company that had a future, you know, we were operating in sustained output. You know, this is, we're gonna go on forever. The company's a hundred and so many years old. And, you know, so now I'd hit the jackpot. I've got the job that it has, you know, it's a perpetual motion machine, right? So, wow. Uh, but um, the noose around my neck with all these accords and these uh, legislative initiatives that could have gone the wrong way and, and essentially rendered our company into, uh, 
insolvency. Well, the fascinating thing about that is I've had the same job essentially since 1991, and arguably largely the same job since 1988, but my title's changed many times. And so I started out being resource manager, and now I'm senior vice president. And it's mostly because the company has gone back to its roots, and we're a timber management company. And uh, when I first started it, we had pulp and paper and pipe companies, and you know, we we're a small division. And now, uh, you know, there's we have a California operations, Washington and Oregon, and uh, that's about it. And so, it's 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 really we're uh, the only game in town, so to speak. So I get a I get a cooler title each time. I, I ran a sawmill for six months, which is no claim to fame. And the mill was really on its last legs when uh, it was my job to run it for a small while. And uh, so that's why the senior is in my vice president title because uh, I had sawmills. Uh, but no longer, so it's really a brevet title. It no longer applies, but they've allowed me to grandfather into it or keep it, so I don't have to get new business cards. So. In 1990, um, the timber wars came upon us. And in 1990, a fellow named Hal Arbit, um, who made a lot of money somehow on Wall Street, he lived in the Bay Area, uh, put up a million dollars to qualify an initiative for the ballot that would have significantly altered how forest, forestry is uh, practiced in the state. And uh, it would have devastated everyone. Um, uh, I would suspect that everybody would have gone to bankruptcy uh, if we'd had to deploy that. And so there was a big uh, uh, push to, uh, to qualify a competing initiative that I think the bad guys called it Big Brown and this, this was Big Green. And then there was a third initiative on the ballot. Anyway, it's so confusing, they all failed. So in 1990, and the election um, was over, uh, we all sighed uh, a bit of relief. Uh, everyone except Hal Arbit, this uh, fellow with a lot of money. And uh, he came to us, the industry, and he said, um, I learned a lot from that, and I'm still wealthy, and I will run another initiative and win this time, unless you can come up with a compromise. And so uh, the industry, here are my... Uh, my environmental colleagues sit down with them and, and create a compromise. And so I, I was a delegate to that from Simpson Timber Company. Um, in the day, uh, we uh, did our best to try to create something that we could live with, and uh, we failed. Uh, and uh, at the end of those conversations, um, the first uh, legislative initiative was spawned called the, the Sierra Accord. And uh, it was the Sierra Accord because no one on the coast could live with it. And unfortunately, uh, that event put a rift in the industry. And so the uh, California uh, Timber Association, or Timber Association of California, TAC, um, had a big meeting where um, the uh, decision was made whether to support this uh, Sierra Accord or oppose it. And the coast said no, and the Sierras said yes, and there were a number, the, the voting uh, went with the Sierras because of the number of hands raised. And so um, it's one thing uh, to have an initiative that will hurt you, it's something else to have one that will put you out of business. So the entire coast split off from uh, the, the Timber Association of California and created a new group, uh, ultimately called the Coastal Working Group. And, um, and so we worked in opposition to the Sierra Accord. And uh, the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we had a Republican governor, George Wilson, or uh, Pete Wilson, rather. And, uh, and so the strategy that got us to the finish line to win and to keep the Sierra Accord from being uh, law, it went to, to Governor Wilson as a piece of legislation. Um, what stopped it from, what, what created the veto there was uh, um, business community tapping his Republican credentials. You just can't do this to us. And so he vetoed it. But in his veto message, he said, I know we can do better. And we uh, are pushing forward another initiative um, f uh, that will be a compromise that everyone can live with. So I was a delegate to that uh, uh, meeting uh, to create something that uh, at, at first it was called the California Accord, uh, which lasted for just a month or two, and then became what ultimately was later termed the Grand Accord. When the new initiative came 
to be. Um, that's when um, the, we tried to work together to create something that we could both live with. And uh, I remember being uh, in a meeting in uh, the resources building in Sacramento on whatever floor that was. Uh, with a woman named Terry Gordon and folks from Sierra Pacific and my company and a few others and uh, proposing something I thought was a compromise that we could live with. And uh, the people on the other side, um, the environmental side, the Sierra Club and the Planning and Conservation League were the two main players in the environmental side, um, they figured they had the votes and they didn't need to, to make the compromise, so they just said no. And so uh, we left and uh, the Coastal Working Group uh, continued to uh, persevere. And uh, in the midst of all that, I have in my wall, uh, I should have brought out to show you uh, a full page ad from the New York Times, dated 1991, that says, uh, Governor Wilson, please sign the Sierra Accord, right? So there was, and on the bottom was uh, half of the industry had signed it. And, uh, and environmental groups and labor groups and so on. But the other half of the industry was the group I was involved with. So uh, these two accords were created. The first one was, uh, was defeated by getting the governor to veto it by tapping his Republican credentials. And the second one came uh, about that was more of a compromise, but still didn't help us. Uh, but it, it, it was um, the people who managed it peeled off a number of the coastal people. So now it wasn't a coastal working group anymore because uh, I've forgotten uh, how many people moved uh, uh, Georgia Pacific and, uh, and uh, 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 Pacific Lumber and so on. Many of the, the companies on the coast uh, supported it. And at the end of the day, there were just a few of us. Uh, it was uh, Simpson and Soper Wheeler Company, Fruit Grower Supply, just a few of us left who uh, were in opposition. And... Uh, Ironically, we defeated that initiative by this rare uh, alignment of polar interests. The Sierra Club, the more, um, uh, the more uh, I intense fraction of the Sierra Club, felt that it didn't go far enough. And so uh, we aligned our interest with theirs. We both didn't like it for different reasons, but neither one of us liked it. And so we... Uh, uh, we were able to convince Willie Brown, who was, you know, at that time uh, the speaker of the assembly, uh, and uh, uh, to essentially vote it down. So it never made it to the governor. Of course, he would have signed it had it gone down. So um, two odd circumstances uh, created these defeats. Um, and so we didn't get a legislative initiative. And you would think, well, the story ends and we all go back to work. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, all of these... Um, uh, forest policy ideas went to the Board of Forestry. And, and if you couldn't do it in law, let's do it in regulation. That was the mantra. So uh, I started being involved in this, I think, in 1991. And the forest practice rules finally changed in 1994. And uh, so we took on issues of clear cut size and watershed protection and stream protection and old growth protection. All the four elements in the bill were all sort of um, driven into regulation in uh, big changes one way or another. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I spent a great deal of time in the legislature, a great deal of time before the Board of Forestry, trying to create something that we could live with. And at the end of the day, we did. In the Sierra, and this is uh, why the Sierras could live with it and why the coast couldn't generally. The Sierras was harvested, these are generalities, but mostly true, in an extensive way. So every acre was harvested once or twice. So all the inventory was scattered over all the acres. Right? On the coast, everything was clear cut. So all of the mature age classes were lumped into just a few spots. Right? And so some whole watersheds were too young to harvest and some whole watersheds were nothing but mature timber. And so if you, you can apply rules that uh, will allow extensive forestry to, to survive, but would cripple uh, intensive forestry. So as an example, the, the biggest uh, difference is, I think it was a two or two and a half percent limit on area harvesting in a watershed per year. And if you have all your inventory in a watershed, you have to harvest more than that or you fail. But if your inventory is scattered across the, everything you own, that's not such a big deal. In fact, that's probably what you're doing anyway. 
And so those kinds of differences really separated us. And uh, it wasn't if one was one side was more green than the other. We were all looking at our own parochial interests, right? And some could do things easier than others. So, uh, and then there were other things like rotation age length and stream width and old growth retention and all those kinds of things that are hot button issues. And, uh, and ultimately we got through those, uh, as an example, the old growth issue we've resolved by leaving old trees behind that have unique character that benefit wildlife. And all the trees in our landscape get a number. And if you get to be a seven or more uh, in score, you get to stay. And you, you get uh, three points for being big and four points for having a, a hole in the butt. And if you have a broken top or recumbent limbs or, you know, if you have these other features, you get more and more points. So if you grow to be a seven, you can stay, right? And, uh, and so that resolved that. I mean, it's, there's still controversy around this from time to time, but it really, it was a way for us to get to something practical that we could live with. And, uh, and so I was uh, involved in all of these legislative and regulatory battles until the end, until 1994. Well, it, um, it, I probably grew more as a person during that time than any other time in my career. Uh, as an example, I was, uh, I was the technical representative, right? And so I was told that I was driving the bus one day to the Capitol and they just wanted to talk to the policy people, the owners of companies and so on. And so I was relieved that I didn't have an assignment that day and then I parked the bus and ran to the Capitol in the 100 degree heat in a Humboldt County wool suit. And uh, I was literally dripping with sweat when they told me, hurry up, they want the technical people now. So I had to you know, sit down at a uh, table um, where all the people who didn't like me, all the opposition was on the other side and they're sitting there, they've been there a long time, and they're a little bit uh, upset that I was late and I show up and, I, and they started asking me these provocative questions. Remember, this isn't, uh, I didn't have friends, right? The people who were proposing these pieces of legislation were all advocates for it, and I was raining on their parade. And, uh, and so uh, I was on the spotlight, and uh, I wasn't uh, prepared. And, uh, and so I, I, uh, it's sort of like that boxing movie, you know? I was not doing a very good job. And uh, one of our lobbyists, a fellow, who uh, uh, was the chief uh, strategist for us, came up and, and sort of bowed his head down and walked up and whispered in my ear. He said, you've got to start doing better. So I think I don't, in, in my life, I don't know I've ever had any more pressure than that in front of a Senate hearing with all the bad guys on the other side getting peppered with questions, being the only representative and having someone tell you to step up your game. And so I did. Uh, and I pulled out uh, our secret weapon which was uh, a visual. It was two redwood rounds, one that was about uh, 12 inches in diameter and the other about three. And I showed them and claimed that this is a redwood grown in the shade, which is three inches, and this is a redwood grown in the sun. And this is why we're in opposition to your bill. And that's when I learned the benefit of a pregnant pause. And, uh, and so, um, so uh, events like that, really helped me understand how to uh, operate in uh, really stressful times. And, uh, and so, I, I, like I said, I, you, know, you, you either step it up or die. <laughs> so, uh, I was just, again, lucky to be given that opportunity and lucky I didn't fail. And, uh, and I learned a great deal about that. And I would say that uh, these are my own experiences, but uh, you know, I didn't single-handedly win the war, you know? There's so many other delightful people that help with strategies and help figure out what the messages were and so on. Um, so I was just part of all of that. And, and so I, I feel uh, honored to have been there and see it all. Um, but I learned a great deal about uh, the, the, the laws and politics and how they're made are uh, really not for the faint of heart. And, uh, and, so, and the one thing I learned, just never give up. You know, had we, had we thought that with all those folks stacked against us, all the enviros and half the industry, that there's no hope for us, um, we should have lost that debate, but we didn't in the end. And we ended up with something, uh, well, I like to claim this, um, that in no way am I responsible for any rule that exists today, but I may have had a small part in helping some rules not find birth. And so um, uh, there's a lot of things that need to change. We, we live in a risk averse view of things. If you look at 
how forestry is applied in the rest of the world, certainly in the Western states. We have a sort of a, a belt and suspenders kind of perspective here in California. And, and it's kind of a shame because it, it, what folks don't understand is it stifles investment and it stifles good forestry if it costs too much. And, uh, you know, California's never met a regulation it didn't like to have. In other words, we take no risk. Um, if there's one bad actor f with some element of some practice, then we'll create a rule. And then, um, th so the belt and suspenders uh, is this. Um, if, you, if you practice forestry in Virginia, you hire a forester and go to work. We, you know, wake up and go logging states, right? If you practice forestry in California, you have to hire someone who's got a license, who's spent f uh, seven years acquiring that, passed the test, um, who then has to follow a, a, a set of specific uh, guidelines in a rule book and that is monitored routinely by a board of forestry that meets once a month and then you're evaluated by another group of people who look at everything you do so just think if we were to manage medicine that way so if your doctor tells you you know I think you gotta have your appendix out you got to go to the state and you have to have a plan and it has to be approved and and uh, a bunch of multidisciplinary people uh, evaluate your doctor's prescription and so I mean it, it's just extraordinarily risk averse that something could go wrong and uh, we were going to uh, regulate us in ways that are uh, Byzantine. And uh, it's too bad. Uh, uh, it's because of the lack of trust that we're going to do it improperly if left to our own devices and that sort of thing. But, you know, it's uh, good forest management is good business. And uh, I just don't know a lot of people. No, I don't think anyone in California appreciates that. And, you know, the inertia of where we are has just kept the ball rolling uh, for so long that we'll... Uh, we probably will continue to be uh, the most regulated state as, uh, as far as I can see for a long, long time. Yeah, so um, you can get results by over applying a measure. So you can get uh, cold water and you can get uh, clean uh, uh, water courses and you can get more fish and you can do all kinds of wonderful things. Um, but you can apply them in, in measures that, uh, th that are inefficient, right? As an example, uh, in fact, arguably, in some cases, they are counterproductive. So as an example, um, the world is a stochastic environment and things change or chaos abounds, right? And so when you look at the natural environment, there are stream zones that were completely denuded by wildfire and others that had shady canopies. But if you really look at what you're trying to produce in that water course, you want the water to be clean and cold and have lots of biomass of things you care about. And we care about anadromous fisheries mostly. And, uh, and if you look at some studies done in Oregon where they remove the canopy from streams, not wholesale, but in uh, some measure to add more light without increasing the temperature and increasing the instability of the side slopes, what you find is you get the benefit of life. Light creates life and more biomass, and you get more of what you want and you get greater, bigger densities, and you get bigger fish, and on and on and on. And so, you know, what is the old adage, uh, moderation is the key, right? So we need to find the sweet spot. You know, the, the pendulum swing is the old paradigm, but, but really uh, what we've done is we've gone too far. We've, ha we've had the perspective that, that forestry, management, whatever you want to call it, is bad. And the best thing we can do is limit it. And so we, we move these lines further and further away from the things we like. But really, we live in a world that's dynamic, right? And so we need to understand that, uh, that in order to keep a system alive, it's going to change. It's going to grow old and go through senescence and so on. And ultimately, it'll get so filled with biomass, it'll burn up and start over. So how do we, how do we operate in that environment to get what we want? And so there are ways. And so to a certain extent, we've gotten what we want. Uh, I look around here when it rains, and the, and it, the streams don't get cloudy. Uh, I look around here uh, during the rainstorms and know that we don't have people up in the woods with shovels trying to fix all the culverts because we fixed them in advance. We've done a lot of storm proofing over the last 15 or 20 years. So the things that we've done work, but we need to figure out how to do things that don't cost so much, right? Because, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can drive to work in a limousine every day, right? Or you can make a more efficient way to work, right? So how do we find those efficient measures, right? And, um, and so uh, one of the big uh, elements in my career, I, I claimed this to our board of directors not long ago, is that I am the person who's been before you trying to acquire a habitat conservation plan, a, an agreement with the federal government to manage endangered species longer than anyone you've ever met. 
And so we, we got our first one in 1992 and for the spotted owl, the first one for a private landowner anywhere in the range of the owl, or actually f- a first habitat conservation plan for a private landowner <laughs> anywhere, okay. and the first one for the owl. Um, and so from then on, we, uh, we spent some time in, in uh, acquired another one for anadromous fisheries, and uh, that took 10 years and six months, very complicated documents. And now we're working on the renewal of our, uh, our second owl plan. So uh, the point is, uh, we have made some big strides to improve what we do on the landscape, and one of the elements in this plan that I'm most proud of is the fact that we have adaptive management measures in it, meaning we can study things, we can do experiments, to decide whether or not that line of protection ought to move both directions and decide we put it in the uh, in a place that's the optimum spot and not the furthest spot, right? And that uh, to think that I was be able to be a part of that, now, I'm not going to see the end of it. These are studies that, you know, they're two or three years in the making and they're going to be 10 years or two or three years ago they started and they're going to be 10 years before they're done. But ultimately we're going to have uh, this um, outcome that's driven a, p- a policy outcome that's driven by science. And most people think that science is going to solve our problems. It's just not the case. Science just tells you what happens when you create a cause and effect. What happens if you do something? It doesn't tell you what you should do. And that's what policymakers are for. How, how many apples equal an orange is what policymakers should understand. How do you trade off the, the efficiency of a practice against the outcome that you're, you're trying to uh, avoid, right? I mean, I, I want to have lots of fish, but I also want to employ people, right? And how do I do this in perpetuity? And how do I create this system that also recognizes that the world doesn't stay the same? So I may have a practice that works great for 10 years, and then 10 years later it doesn't. Or I may have a practice that works great, but not so after the world warms up. And so having an adaptive management system in a long-term permit is one of the things I'm most proud of. And, and so uh, you got me rambling here, but the point is uh, uh, all those kind of things allow us to get to some promised land for me. And that is if we can find out how to manage this land to get what we want instead of managing this land to avoid the perception of things are bad. You're evil, and so the less evil you do and less evil you are, the better off I will be. That's just wrong. And so that's not just a scientific question. That is a human interaction question. And that goes to the, um, that goes to the heart of that question is based in trust. And so I have this view, particularly now that we have to so the Republicans in the White House, you know, that instead of jinking to the right and say, now we can get what we want, we go back to, you know, to get all these things that, that hurt us in the past, we'll roll them all back. Rather than to do that, I think we ought to work together with the folks who are back on their heels, these um, um, sort of uh, these uh, NGO groups, and figure out how we can work together to get some place in the future that gets this spot that's right, that doesn't look at us as evil, that doesn't limit what we do, um, but looks at us as uh, 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 a management system draped on the landscape to achieve what we, our objectives. What do we want? We want clean water. We want lots of fish. We want, we want places to recreate. We want nice views. You know, let's, let's try to agree on those things and figure out to get outcomes from our lands that can achieve these kinds of things. I, I, um, I have a friend, one of my best friends in the world is a poet. And uh, uh, I met her... Um, about seven years ago. I lost my wife to cancer eight years ago. And uh, my friend, the poet, helped me uh, uh, write. She wrote a poem for my wife after she read some of my wife's writings. And uh, and uh, so we became great friends. Uh, and through the first half of our interaction, she didn't know who I was. And then she found out that I ran Green Diamond. And she was... Uh, if she had known that before, we would never have had a personal connection. But we had that. And so uh, we uh, spent a lot of time together. We go to the woods. We talk about uh, uh, everything. It's good friends. And uh, uh, she asked me if we could um, develop uh, what she called a uh, Friends of the Forest group, which is a little hokey to say that. But what she meant was um, she knows environmentalists and tree sitters and so on, people that hate me. And she met one the other, some time ago, and, and, uh, and he was railing on about me. And she said, have you ever met him? And he said, no. 
And she got mad and she said, well, what do you expect to just snap your fingers and get anything you want? You should meet him. And so um, he did. And we spent a couple of meetings together. And um, because of that interaction, we changed some lines around and uh, we, uh, we added more money to a project to save the trees they were sitting in and so on. And so it was you know, hailed as this victory. But my friend, the poet, uh, told me that she wanted to create this uh, Friends of the Forest group. And it's, she says that uh, most of these environmental folks that are activists are angry. And what they want to do is make demands that they know I can't agree with. And that's their objective, is, is to shove it up my nose. And they know I can't say yes. And she said, what do you think would happen if we put a set of, uh, put a group together where the objective was and the rules of the road were that you had to come with something that you thought I could do, something you thought I would do, and then I would come with an open mind and I would be willing to implement something. And, uh, and so there's a bit of a story in, a, uh, in my career that manifests that. Um, when I first came here uh, to Simpson uh, in that second job in 1991, um, through no fault of anyone's, but just the way the history had gone, is uh, our interaction generally, I would say, with the Yurok tribe was uh, uh, their criminals and our security people, right? I mean, the people who are doing bad things, right? But that's not representative of the tribe at all, right? And so uh, they came to me and they wanted to do things. Uh, they wanted to do a white deer skin dance, so they, they wanted to get a, a hunting permit, and we said yes, and then we let them hunt on our land with permits. and. And then we started cooperating with them on uh, doing uh, fisheries restoration and road repairs and so on and so forth. So uh, we went from a tiny little bit of success. And at the end of 2016, we finished the sale of 47,000 acres of land that has become their homestead, their, their reservation. And uh, we have a great uh, relationship with the Yurok tribe. And it started out very, very small. And so to the extent that we can find people who are willing to find ways for us to find things to agree on, the first thing that happens is that you build a teeny relationship. And then you, that relationship is made of trust. And then all of a sudden, you, someone comes with something that you think, instead of a blunt instrument to hurt you with, it may be something that would be at least benign, if not maybe successful, right? And so um, I've not yet gotten there with this group. Uh, my poet friend has moved away and we haven't uh, established uh, any, um, any group like this, but, I th but I th I'd like to, th to live in a world where we can have disagreement without discord. And unfortunately, uh, too often all we see are the extremes and, uh, and it shouldn't drive the policy and it shouldn't drive what we do and it shouldn't be how we change our uh, management practices. And if you think of the power of this, where uh, uh, moderate people who can figure out ways to uh, achieve benefits that we can all agree on and do it in ways that are the most efficient way to do things, I mean, is that, doesn't that give you hope in the future? And so, you know, I wish I could start my career again because I really like to start there and, you know, work with some uh, uh, like minded people. I, I was at a bar the other day and, uh, uh, I walked by this guy who we used to be on opposite sides of the podium. Uh, this guy was, you know, a restorationist guy. And, uh, and uh, so, he, you know, and now we're great friends. He gave me a hug and, and said, you know, isn't it funny? Here we are in our 60s and we're good friends. And we need to teach these kids that that's the way it should be. So I don't know how to get there, but if there's some way to the, that, you know, some kind of legacy that we could leave, well, you know, not me, but this, cadre of people that were that spent the last 30 years or 40 years you know wrestling um i don't know i i think it has it has to do with with trust and the willingness to take a few risks and say yes and and try things and uh and so um i've had some discussions with uh, my colleague dan tomacheski about these things you know i've been doing my job for a long long time i've been managing the woods here you know for 30 odd years so I have the, the wherewithal to take risk, right? I mean, if I got this job last week, I mean, I, I would be extraordinarily risk averse, right? But no one's gonna 
uh, uh, be suspect of my motivation. You know, I've got a reputation, people trust me and all that. So I have almost an obligation to try this, right? And, and Dan and I have talked about this. He's had a similar career to mine, you know, much bigger company, much more responsibility, but the same idea that we've been doing this for a while and people aren't gonna be suspect of our motivation. So how, uh, so, so this is where I, I think, geez, what, what can I do, you know, in the next few years while I'm still working is to try to create some kernel of something that has uh, legs, that has longevity. Uh, uh, how can we start this, this interaction and dialogue with people to create this sort of, um, uh, lack of, uh, of, of acrimony, you know, it, uh, you don't, you just get the bad solutions when two acrimonious sides, when what you get is a, po a political solution. You don't get a solution that has benefits, has the maximum amount of benefits to it. And so, geez, I really wish I could figure out how to do this. And so that's what kind of excites me about where I am today. Um, on the on the policy side, since we started this leg of policy, um, but a raid behind you is uh, 365,000 acres. It's just wonderful forest land that that I've helped be uh, a part of shaping in over the last 30 odd years, and it's the other part of my job that really winds my watch is the notion that uh, you know we've because uh, um, I have this business background. I feel like when I spend money that I'm making a promise to the owners of my company to spend it wisely. And so when I tell them, if you give me money to do, to invest in forests, you know, pre-commercial thinning and so on, that you're gonna get a certain yield out the back end of that. And I look around, I drive into the woods and I see the kind of things we're doing and I look at the forest we're creating and I feel like we're making good on that promise. And that just, you know, part of it has to do with I've been here so darn long, right? So I can see what it used to look like and what it looks like now and where I, and I can go somewhere else to see what it will look like, you know, 10 years down the road. But, um, you know, we really are, the, my generation, the folks who've worked in the last 30, 40, 50 years, really were on the cutting edge of modern forest management, taking, uh, not just putting lines around, uh, uh, old growth to make clear cuts, which is how I started, but now really managing this whole forest. And we're not just doing it for the trees, right? You know, we have uh, uh, biologists and botanists and, and uh, hydrologists and geologists and so on. And so we're trying to manage all these elements and do it in an efficient way and do it in a way that achieves real results and not just political outcomes that make some belt and suspenders person happy. And, uh, and so that really winds my watch. And the way we've done it is through these long-term landscape plans. So we at Green Diamond have never uh, found a, lar a long-term landscape plan we didn't like. So we have them all. Um, we have habitat conservation plans for endangered species. And uh, we have programmatic plans to uh, do road repairs. Uh, we have... Uh, water quality landscape plans that make sure we're uh, complying with all the, the Clean Water Act uh, uh, regulations. And then finally, at the end of all that, and these are all ways to make regulation more efficient on landscape, uh, we decided, well, shoot, let's, uh, let's apply for Forest Stewardship Council certification. So we got all the rest of it, and each one of those elements of landscape planning added a little bit of bump to what the uh, uh, ordinary um, the landowner would have to do. So uh, when you add it all up, it's pretty impressive. And so we thought we could uh, we could become FSC certified. Uh, took a couple of years because we had to change our practices. Um, and mostly we had to become more open and transparent to the public, which I think, given what I said earlier, is, you know, uh, a good thing. And so, uh, so we are FSC certified. Um, we have these plans that have long-term adaptive management outcomes. And we'll, I think, um, render this into uh, one of the best output. The forest will have the best output from a productivity point of view and from an environmental uh, compliance point of view for all those public trust resources, clean water. And you know, we have more spotted owls than anyone else, right? I mean, we have the highest density of spotted owls recorded anywhere in the history of uh, or in the, in the literature for spotted owls. So uh, we can have our cake and eat it too, right? Um, so gosh, it comes back to this theme that I'm the luckiest person you've ever met. I got to be a part of all this. I got to, you know, 
uh, help uh, create these, this outcome that's arrayed around us. And I can drive homes and look at it um, the long way, you know, go look at the woods for an hour before I come home every night. Um, it's hard to find a more satisfying career than forestry because you get to see it. And I get to see it on my back window. So. You know, I, uh, I went to work for a company, as I, th as I said, that, that really had the handwriting on the wall. We were cutting old growth trees and, you know, that's, that one day they were going to be gone. And I don't, we didn't really know what was going to happen after that. But then I went to work for this company that had, uh, I think I started working uh, just before the centennial, right? And so now we're 127 years old. And, uh, and so they have this long history and legacy of being in this business. And so... Um, one of the things that you recognize in a family-owned business uh, is that there's a need to, uh, to find ways to mitigate risk of being in that business. And, and one of those ways is to take the long view, right? And so the long view for us was to settle the issue of uh, environmental uh, uh, policy by getting habitat conservation plans that put in place this stability. Uh, even though there's adaptive management, at least the, the, we, we understand the, the limits and the range of all that. And so uh, we, we traded off costs for uh, risk management. And, and so that allowed us um, the ability to plan better and allowed us uh, the ability, arguably, um, uh, in the time value of money calculation, the value of an asset is the value of its income over time discounted by the risk of being in that business. And so uh, you can argue that your company is worth more if you've limited the risk, which I believe we had. And although, it's, yes, it's expensive, um, the expense for us um, is diminishing over time as we prove that the water is cold and that the trees uh, grow in certain fashion and so on. And so to the extent we, get, we come to the end of monitoring, um, we can reduce that cost and mitigate it. But but we have this perspective that it's a long-term asset and we're willing to invest in it um, for the value that uh, may not accrue to people who don't have generational views. You know, my boss asked me what I'm doing for his grandchildren, right? He's 40 years old, his ch oldest child is eight, right? So they, you know, I'm, I'm blessed again. I'm the luckiest person you've ever met. I think I told you that. Because I work for a company that has generational perspective. Now I feel an obligation to manage it as efficiently as I can. I mean, you can, you can uh, rely on this perspective of risk mitigation as a crutch. So we still have to run a viable business. You know, we have to do all the things business people do. But we're allowed to look at things, in, or we're, uh, we're incented to look at things that add value to the asset in the long term. And, um, and so we've done that. We've been, you know, pioneers in tree improvement for Redwood for years. And we've, we're, and we've gotten the benefit of that. And now we're reducing our commitment to that because we've already, we got the answer. And so the businessman in me says, let's reduce that because we got the answer. And the, and the asset manager in me says, what, isn't it wonderful that we've figured out how to uh, find these wonderful trees that add value to our tree farm? So, um, y you know, it's, um, it's great to do both, right? And maybe that's the theme of my career. I've, when given a choice, I do both. I had the pleasure of working for a fellow through the vast majority of my career who was arguably the best leader I've ever run across. Um, and uh, I was, uh, he's still around, his name is Jim Brown. He was the president of uh, uh, Green Diamond uh, at the end of his career. But uh, uh, when he retired, uh, the company put a, f uh, a scholarship in place in his honor. And so even though he's still around, he was unable to go to the last scholarship. Uh, he's a Humboldt State graduate, so the scholarship is at Humboldt. And uh, I went to the banquet a couple of weeks ago and, uh, and presented his scholarship. So I got to tell a little story about him. He um, came to Humboldt State as a 17-year-old kid from Venice Beach, California. And didn't have any money, so he worked his way through forestry school at the plywood plant. And I like to claim he's the first student who trimmed his way through college. That's a, that's a humble county joke. Um, but uh, he worked his way through school, and uh, he ended up graduating and going 
uh, to San Jose State to get his master's in engineering. Got through uh, forestry school at Humboldt and then went off to get a degree in, uh, in engineering, a master's degree in engineering at San Jose State. Was working construction and uh, I think the way he says it, uh, his uh, National Guard leader told him he should go to a meeting and he thought he should go water skiing. And so he ended up uh, getting in Dutch with the National Guard so they sent him to Vietnam. And uh, which is where most people went from the National Guard. And uh, since he was uh, uh, had a graduate degree, they sent him over there as a first lieutenant in charge of a uh, an engineering combat engineering group. And so he's a pretty modest guy. So he, he only told me this one time, but uh, he went to Vietnam in charge of a group of people who didn't belong to anyone. This combat engineers, they'd go from place to place, and the company never really owned them. So they were always out in the front. And so when he got there, they had some of the highest casualties of any group in the company. Um, and so Jim Brown went to the company commander and said, this has got to stop. We're not going to be on the point anymore. And he brought everybody home. So that's the guy that I worked for. And I met him, uh, that place I was telling you earlier where I f uh, first went to work swinging an ax. Um, um, it was that summer at the uh, end of the day, I'd made my way uh, working through the bottom of uh, a harvesting unit and uh, jumped out on the road and there's the guy down there working on a tractor, pushing uh, dirt from a slide. And he sees me and uh, jumbles down off the tractor and sticks his hand out and says, hi, I'm Jim Brown. And that's, so I met him. He was running a tractor, and uh, he, he found out uh, when he got out of the uh, uh, army, he got a job teaching engineering at Humboldt State Forestry School. He taught, uh, I think, surveying and engineering, and he found out that summer that he only got paid nine months instead of 12, and so he needed a job. So he went to work in the woods at Arcata Redwood Company setting chokers, and uh, it wasn't long, but a year or so later, he's running the road crew, and that's when I met him. And, uh, and uh, he, has, uh, he was the, uh, a mentor of mine for my career. He, uh, when uh, he became the general manager of the company in 1988, he asked me to run the woods for him. And, uh, and of course I said yes. And, uh, and then he made the, I made the transition from Arcata Redwood to Simpson. And then he made the transition in, I made it in 91 and he came over in 1997. I, went to a management school many years ago and uh, one of the lessons they taught there was uh, uh, by a guy named Lou Holtz who is a football coach I think from Notre Dame and Lou Holtz said that everybody looks for three characteristics in a leader they want to know if they're committed to the enterprise they want to know if you can trust them and they want to know if you care about me and so if you find someone who cares about you, truly does, you can trust them, and they're committed to enterprise, all the things that we're about together, you can do anything. And Jim Brown epitomized that. And uh, I would do almost anything to avoid disappointing him. And so that made him a great leader in my mind. And we're still great friends. And, and, uh, I see him from time to time. He's on my uh, retired guy lunch routine. So there's a bunch of re guys who retire and I take him out to lunch once in a while and just keep him up to speed what's going on. Well, I get to do that. Uh, the economics class at Humboldt, force economics class comes out once a year. And, and, uh, and so I take him out in the woods and I tell him how and why we make decisions and uh, try to get him enthusiastic about forestry and about coming to work here at Green Diamond. And, uh, but I, I tell them two things. Uh, if you want to be successful in forestry, you need to have two um, skills, among all the technical skills that you need to know. But there's two that are most important for success in my view. The first is understanding the time value of money. This is a investment back business. So if you grow trees, you put money in today and you get the value out sometime in the future. And you need to know about that calculation plus how to manage and mitigate risk, right? In all its various forms. That's the first thing. The second one is you have to be good at public speaking. 
because you can be the smartest person in the world, but if you can't talk to someone, if you can't convey your ideas and communicate in a way that people uh, believe you, uh, then it doesn't matter as much. You can magnify what you are if you can get ideas into other people's heads. And you have to own it. You know, you have to, you have to really, it has to be you. So don't, you know, uh, you know the old adage of uh, all the success in life is honesty. And once you learn how to fake that, you've got it made, right? Well, that's just not true. You just have to be who you are, and, but be willing to put it out there and, and be a good communicator. And, and so I, I, I told that to students over the years. And I'm sitting next to a fellow uh, at a dinner not long ago, who is also uh, manages a forest, uh, and uh, he told me that that's exactly what he tells the students when they come out. So at least I'm validated by two people's view. Um, I hope we can. This is a hope, and I hope that turns into reality. And I'm going to do my best as I end my career to make it so. And that is, I hope that we can tone down the acrimony and get to real solutions. Uh, I was at a meeting uh, just recently with the Fish and Wildlife Service to talk about how we can work together to get ahead of species listings. And we can do that by, we can do so many things to change a little bit in how we manage our forest to uh, improve conditions so that we obviate the need for listings. Nobody wants to have a species extinction named after them. Jeez, I mean, come on, we, we all care about what we've done in our lives. And so uh, what we care about is maybe doing something today that will affect a future to avoid some bad outcome. And uh, we can only do that if we work and talk to each other. And that only happens if we have trust. And trust only comes if we actually interact from time to time. And we don't interact in an acrimonious environment of, you know, I have power and you have a, need a permit and all that. But let's get out of that. And, um, and so uh, there's two kinds of regulatory folks in the world. There are police people, enforcement-minded people, and collaborative people. And there's a need for enforcement people because we drive too fast sometimes, right? And so I'm not saying that there shouldn't be that on the landscape because there's a, the world is a bell-shaped curve and there's some people who need to be to have in, enforcement uh, actions taken upon them. But the vast majority of the people really want to do something good. And so let's build a collaborative model that gets ahead of all these things and, and let's try to figure out how we can get what we want without regulation, without building a new rule for everything. Let's figure out how, I mean, for Stewardship uh, Council of Conservation, uh, the, the SFI is all about that. It's how do we manage these lands in a way that achieves these results without turning a blind eye to the public, without turning a blind eye to things that are public trust resources and narrowly focusing on income. We have to, we do our job, the, our, uh, you know, our, our factory floor is the hillside. So let's embrace that, bring people up, figure out how to work this all together, and then start building trust with everybody who has a stake in what we do. With, with this outcome that we're trying to make the world a better place where we have commonalities of interest. Um, if you really don't like a clear cut, um, then we're going to have some difficulties. But if, if we, what you care about is the view from where your kids have a swing in your backyard, or some cases we talk to people who tell us our trees have been shading out their rose bushes for the last 20 years. So they have an outcome. But if we can figure out how to work together for common interest and, and with both the public and the regulatory interests and so on, my hope is that in the future, forestry is thought of with the same kind of welcoming feelings you get when you look out on a farm. And when you see a freshly cut uh, cornfield uh, with stubble, you don't think, oh my gosh, a clear cut. You think it's a farm. And so if we can somehow figure out how to achieve that uh, normalization or that, um, that uh, acceptance in what we do, that we're not abusive, this is how we do things, and it achieves these kinds of results. Um, I work with a park over the last 30 odd years, and uh, the park, uh, the Redwood National Park, when I first got here, I, uh, I was here four days before they changed the locks on the second park expansion. And so there's a lot of acrimony on both sides. You know, don't park my job and all that. Um, and so uh, it took a while, but we began uh, to build relationships with the park. And I think the first time I remember we took their, their interpreters on a field tour, 
because I, somehow I got the notion, somebody told me that they're, on their tours they were claiming we were still uh, doing reforestation by dumping seeds from helicopters because no one ever talked to them about what we really do. So we took them on a field tour and uh, at the beginning of the meeting I told them um, my daughter, I think was eight years old, I said, I don't want to go to fourth grade and have to decide whether she likes parks or what her dad does for a living. We both have legitimate roles in life. And we just want to explain what we do, and we like to hear what you do, and we like to have you understand what we do, so when you talk to people in your park, you get it right. And since then, we've been iterating this uh, uh, reaction, interaction with the park, and uh, trying to normalize relations with the park. And now, this is the one, uh, we're not there yet, but um, when I first came here in 1977, I went up the Bald Hills Road to a place that was called Devastation Point, and there was a sign there. And it was a low uh, sign with a f photograph of uh, uh, a view looking through old logging rigging, you know, on a water bar. It looked horrible. And it talked about how bad the logging was. So you, you roll the world forward now here to 2014. And we're working on a conservation easement to sell development rights on our Redwood Creek property, which is just upstream from the park. And part of that uh, accommodation is to put a trail through our riparian area so that you can go from a county road upstream of the Redwood uh, Park all the way down Redwood Creek to the mouth. So access, public access across us, which is one heard of, you know, just some years ago. And uh, we did that as an accommodation for this uh, conservation easement. And uh, the new park superintendent on the tour stopped me and said, you know, wouldn't it be great somewhere along that path where there's a nice opening on a point to put a park bench and have a sign that interpreted what people were seeing and you could talk about how you were managing your land for sustainability. Yeah. So, and that was what, almost 40 years between the two events. So that's where I hope we go. And I'm hopeful, uh, I'm hopeful because I see people on the other side who want to do it too. And I, you know, I think there's trustworthy people all around, we just need to find them. We need to find the collaborators. You know, God love the enforcing people. They have a role in life, but you can't make collaborators out. It's very hard. So we need to find the right people who are willing to take the risk, willing to f find relationships of trust. You know, uh, policemen, uh, trust isn't their strong suit, right? And so, uh, but we can find people who can build these bridges. And, and then we can get to outcomes that no one ever dreamed of. We can get to outcomes where there's plenty of fish and lots of jobs and, you know, all the things people said we couldn't do, we, we, we're going to be able to do it. Well, an ideal forest is many forests. You know, it's one that you work in, it's one that you play in, it's one that you uh, keep unique things uh, and protect things that have uh, value that can't be easily replicated. And so it's a forest that has, it's kind of like the one we have here. We've got parks and we've got working forests uh, uh, and that it, it provides the things that we want in life. You know, we're, we're not there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that I think we could improve upon. You know, our, our forests are dying and burning up and we have trouble uh, figuring out how to uh, take on policy matters that, uh, that allow us to uh, keep rural uh, landowners safe, you know. And, uh, but there are ways, that, but I, I, I'm hopeful that we're getting there. Uh, someday, but I, I mean, I, it's certainly not all industrial, and it's not all park, and it's it's not all wildland. It's uh, it's it's all of everything. And the one thing I've learned, uh, uh, Hank Box uh, was a professor. When I used to be, I think he was the first chair of the Board of Forestry many years ago. He was a professor at Berkeley, and uh, he said, "I envy you guys because you're going to have a career with so many challenges that it's going to be a pleasure to work." Uh, when you do, and uh, and he was right, and uh, and so I think I could lay claim to the same thing. I envy the next set of people because I think they're going to see. I'm hopeful they see detente and they see a forest that is normalized and that we are seen as legitimate managers of it, and uh, so that's the kind of forest I want for the future.
I became a student member back in what, 74, 75, 76, something, mid 70s, I can't remember when it was. And then, uh, 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 you know, we there hasn't been a Jed Smith chapter in a long time, and so I have not been extraordinarily involved except sending my check in from time to time. So there's not really much to say. And, and why so. do you send your check in? Well, um, I do because I think it's important to um, to be involved in the professional organization that represents all of us. And I, you know, I'm also part of the California. Licensed Forces Association, much more of a political, you know, regulatory bent to that. But uh, it's nice to see uh, what's going on around the rest of uh, the U.S. And, um, you know, we have uh, LIDAR here uh, to help manage our force. And I remember reading about LIDAR and thinking, oh, that's too expensive for us. We'll never do that. Of course, now we have it. So, you know, just get a sense of what's happening in the rest of the world and see how... uh, we fit into our practices. You can, you know, they, they call this the Redwood Curtain. You know, you can get parochial here and sort of get hidebound in your ways. And so SAF helps broaden that view. Yeah, I, um, no, I mean, I think you've, uh, you've let me drone on here about all kinds of things that uh, I thought were, were interesting. Uh, you know, I, I, just been very lucky. I mean, I, just to reiterate, I know I've said that in the past, uh, but uh, I can't imagine uh, having a more uh, gratifying career than having done what I've done. And, uh, you know, I'm just, to be able to work for a company and a family and a group of people, I just, you know, the folks here, I just, um, it's so great to see the people we have here uh, do their work. One of the common uh, reactions we get from people who've been on tours with us is that your people really like what they do. And I think, oh my gosh. Um, that's such a wonderful thing uh, that we can do that and deliver on our obligations to make this a viable business and deliver on our permits and in the community and you know. And, uh, so I uh, I really really enjoy it. <laughs>